We're going to talk market scanning secrets, so talking about how do you start boiling down your uh, ideas, because let's face it, the, the markets are full of so much information that I think one of the challenges, I don't know about you, but I face is information overload. You know, you're getting all of this information pouring at you faster and faster with the internet. The power of the internet is a great thing, but you've got to have some ways to filter to get the information you want and not a lot of other noise. Same thing with the markets. You've got thousands of potential securities. And we're going to talk about it as it relates to swing trading, in particular as it relates to options. So, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll focus on that, but you can use this whether you traded stocks, uh, futures, forex, uh, ETFs, you name it. Just a quick reminder, of course, that everything that I'm sharing with you here in our time together is for your information and education only today. Uh, nothing that I talk about, even as I look at live market examples, nothing should, here should be considered a specific recommendation of buy or sell any particular investment. Uh, part of the reason I say that is because, you know, uh, we send out real-time email alerts, not just when it's time to get in to our su subscribers, but also real-time when it's time to get out with specific targets and stops. I don't want you to buy something and not know where you need to get out of it, okay? So keep that in mind. Just soak this in educationally today. Also, you know that you are solely responsible for your investment decisions and Big Trends and staff are responsible for any trades you choose to make. And, and not all uh, Big Trends products and services are appropriate for all types of investors. Uh, so, you know, we don't provide any personalized financial tax or legal advice at Big Trends, we send it out to everybody at the same time via real-time email and uh, text alert. So bottom line is do consult your tax advisor before you make any investment that might impact your unique tax situation. So we want to talk about the markets. Obviously, the markets have been incredibly volatile. Uh, you know, I was on CNBC uh, in New York there uh, back in late September, September 25th, right when the Pope was there actually in New York. Uh, it was a fun time, a busy time there, but bottom line is that I was saying, don't panic. It's t You want to be bullish here. You don't want to be bearish. Now things are shifting a little bit in the short term at least. Uh, you know, I'm still a longer term uh, favorably inclined on this market because uh, there's been a lot of doubters, but in the short term, we're going to talk today. You're going to see it on the charts about what's next. The support and resistance gets defined for you by the chart automatically. You don't have to hand draw uh, a lot of stuff when you have just a few key simple things that you can look at. And so that's what I love about what I'm going to share with you today is just a, an indicator that you probably aren't following that you should be considering adding to your trading arsenal. Uh, we also, of course, know that every good trading approach has to have a way to manage not just the initial stop you put on the trade, but how you trail that stop so that you don't uh, give up too much of your profits on good trades. You give yourself a chance, but you basically say bye-bye if it's not doing exactly what it should be doing. Um, we'll talk about new trend ideas with a lot of chart examples from swing trades we've made of late. Uh, you know, we call it the three E's of trading. We want to keep it easy, of course. Uh, bottom line is that uh, everything I'm sharing with you here is a, really a very simple approach. So especially if you're new to the concept of trading an option, or, or even if you have traded options, you know, you'll find that this is a way you can get appropriate leverage, keep it simple, and still manage your risk. We're focusing on the education piece. Kind of if you thought of it as a bullseye, you're, you're, uh, you're targeting to hit that bullseye. You've got to get pointed in the right direction first. So we're going to try to do that. I'll help you with that. And then scanning. We talked about how do you come up with your ideas. Well, we're going to talk about how we go explore and narrow our focus with scanning ideas. And then ultimately it's about being able to pull the trigger uh, and hit that target once you have that laser focus. Okay, So that's the execution piece and we keep it really simple. So here's the discovery I want to share with you. And I, everything that I, that I go through, I've been trading for 25 years, and basically what I find is that I don't have to go invent everything that I trade, okay? You should, you should stand on the shoulders of giants wherever you can, uh, and I've certainly recognized a lot of great uh, – uh, fellow analysts and traders and uh, innovators uh, in my uh, time since I launched Big Trends back in 99. Uh, but this is one that's based on a guy, Richard Donchian, invented this idea of Donchian channels. And it's it's a pretty simple idea. He said basically if you go mark what's the latest new high and the latest new low over any given period of time, we can then just draw those lines in as channels. And uh, we'll look at a variety of those today. One of the things that we found when we were testing this idea and saying, okay, when does it work, when does it not work, is it worked a lot better when you could trade the short-term trends, uh, what we call basically the noise, if you will, the short-term, against the longer-term trend. So let's face it, day-to-day, Anything can happen in the markets, okay? We, you have to first acknowledge that, that even if you have a longer-term, say, bullish view, and even if you've been correct, 
you can be, if your timing's not right, you can be sitting on a, a, a good idea that you get flushed out of. You probably experience that in your trading if you're basically just uh, in some of that short-term noise. So a big part of it is we want to be positioned here to buy the dips and put on our trades within the major uptrends into a pullback. So it's this is not a breakout trading system. This is more of a, of a retracement kind of a system where you buy in your support. And meanwhile, you sell those bounces into resistance in the in the clear longer term downtrends. So um, so we'll we'll look at a couple of those examples here. Where we can get some flavor on this. And uh, probably the first place that we'll start is the S and P. But the whole point of this is this is a very systematic approach. Okay, I'm not coming in and just picking out ideas just because I feel like a stock is acting better or worse. I'm actually saying the system has to actually tell me that it's giving me an up arrow buy signal or a down arrow sell signal. I think more money is lost trading from the gut than pretty much anywhere else. And I think that comes back to three dangerous letters. I'm going to write them on here. You can probably guess. What are the three letters? What's the what's the a little crossword puzzle, you can see that's what we call our Sunday Night Trader system that we base all this on. If I was giving you a three-letter word starting in E for what's the thing that can be most damaging to your trading, what might you guess it would be the last two letters of that would be? I mean, it's only three letters. Emotion is a good is a good guess, but yes, uh, trader, trader, and Peter get it. It's I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. It's E G O ego. Your ego is actually um, is vested in what? It's vested in being proven right. If you think about that, the entire schooling system gives you grades based on how right you are. If you're wrong, you get worse grades, right? So you better be right as you go through the schooling system. As you get into the traditional career paths, the more right you are, the more you get promoted, the more raises you get. The more wrong you are, the more risk you have of being fired, of not going anywhere in that in that job or that career, right? So we're always vested in being proven right so much that we then convert into trading. Just a quick psychology lesson here that basically you are so vested in being proven right that you have, a, I bet most of you have a big problem because I had this problem early in my trading career. When you're in a losing trade, do you ever find that you hold your losing trades too long and the small loss becomes a bigger loss than you would like it to be? Because you couldn't let it go because you weren't being proven right. You were waiting and hoping that you were going to go from that slight loser to that winner and then you'd sell it when it became a winner, right? That's your ego being involved in your trading, okay? Just a quick little side note. Nobody's ever had that experience, right? I'm not going to name names, but if you've had that experience, uh, type a Y for yes that you can relate to you know hoping too much on losing trades let me flip it around and talk about okay you know bottom line here's another one yeah you can some of you can heck yes can one of you says can uh, can really uh, relate to that here's another way that this that this trips you up your desire to be proven right is so strong that as soon as you get a winning trade you take that quick small profit thinking, well, I can't go broke taking a profit, right? So you book your quick profits, and then you leave lots of money on the table when you were really right. You didn't get a chance to get paid off because you took your gain at a small gain, and then it went on to a monster gain without you on board. You ever seen that happen? Yeah, we can all relate, right? That, that's, that, again, is a desire to be proven right. And several of you mentioned you have both of those experiences. Yes, that's somewhat the nature of trading. But a big part of this is is being very systematic and getting away from second guessing yourself and getting focus instead on taking our ego out and let's just execute the system. I find this system requires a little more discipline up front and discipline's a word that turns people off. You know, you think you get into trading because of its freedom, that it's financial freedom you're after. Well, guess what? With freedom comes responsibility, right? It's like you're free to drive a car, but if you're wrecking it, uh, it, it uh, irresponsibly, uh, you're going to lose that privilege, right? Um, so the idea is, you know, that you know, how much better can you be with a precise method? I find it just takes a lot of the stress out of the constant questioning that we do in our minds as traders. You know, there's so many of those thoughts rattling around up there in our minds going, what should I do next? I want to get rid of that what do I do next question for you with a very clean systematic approach and just saying let me focus instead on this word of executing the system. When it says buy, we buy. When it says sell, we sell. Whatever happens after that, we don't worry about because we know in our heart of hearts that we're following the system. If the system is well tested and it gives you a positive expectancy, a positive edge, 
then you can basically allow yourself to focus on that. Now, you don't want it to be too complex because that will cause your mind to freeze. So we want to say, let's keep the system as simple as it needs to be, but no simpler. And so, you know, like here's a prior chart of the S&P. I'm going to show you the current S&P chart here in a sec. But, you know, what this system is based on, is basically buying these short-term Donchian highs and lows. Uh, so on the case of we're above the long-term trend line. So that long-term trend line in yellow earlier in the year was a plus. Guess what? We just try to buy the support on those pullbacks on the white lower Donchian channels. There's sometimes where you're already in a trade, and sometimes you may get a quick stop out. Like this first one here, you saw it got a quick stop out. Then you got the next one here that bought, and then you see the dotted line, it, it said it ran all the way up to a profit target there. You think, oh, it went a little bit higher. Guess what? You don't worry about that. You buy the next pullback, even endure a couple days down, and then sell into the first Don Chin resistance up here a little bit later, about a week and a half later. You know, so the idea here, sometimes they happen really quick. You can see this one happened back there um, at the start of the year in a few days. You know, those spikes can be dramatic. Let's look at the current market for a second and put that into some perspective for you. Because, you know, everybody's, you know, wants to know where's the market going next. And so I, I do this on TradeStation because this is where my data testing is based on. Now, interestingly enough, you can see that the market broke down below the longer term yellow trend line and interestingly on yesterday's action got a gap up above it for the first time in about uh, two and a half months. Well, the, the point here is that when we get the right setup, here was an example of the right setup back here. We're now below the long-term trend line, so we want to sell into that resistance. We got close to it right there, but it flipped down too hard intraday. We're looking at these in a closing basis, and you can see then it closed. This was the day before uh, Janet Yellen's Fed meeting announcement here on September 16th. And you can see on that day, uh, we got a sell signal on the S&P SPY, the SPY, one of the most active vehicles out there, traded 144 million shares on uh, on uh, on that uh, on Friday, actually yesterday. You can see though, coming into it, we were getting this sell signal right around 200. Intraday, we ran up and then we flipped. We did not get stopped out, and then you know what happened? Yellen said we're not going to raise rates. And then she kind of spooked the market back then because people were hoping that she was going to make some comments that the economy was stronger, but actually that was implied by her comments that the economy was weaker. You know and I know that maybe the easiest job out there might be to be a reporter because they'll tell you why the market went up or went down on the same data, right? Um, you know, bottom line is they got deadlines, so I know if you're a reporter out there, it's stressful too. But bottom line is that from a, from a market interpretation standpoint, uh, the news reporters uh, tend, and financial news reporters tend to tell us the market dropped because the Fed didn't uh, imply that the economy was that strong right here on the big gap down. If 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 the Fed says they're not going to raise rates, you would think that's a positive right there, but instead, what I'm telling you is that because we're into resistance, the odds that we're going to see selling pressure are essentially greater. You can see on that signal, it trended down to a nice profit target for us on the downside on September 24th. Now. You can notice here that um, that signal worked. You can see the last couple haven't worked as well. And if it's not working, we have very tight stops where we'll hop right back out. And I saw some other things happening here that there, that I did get stopped out of this one, but this next one I didn't take from about a week ago. Why? Because some of the other things we look at, like the percent R moving into that overbought territory, that's usually actually a sign of a strengthening trend. Uh, this DMI line getting uh, violated that next trade is just too strong of a, of a directional movement trend. You don't want to fight that directional movement trend. We teach a lot of those things. However, quick little um, you know assessment of where we are right now. You can see that as of right now, the market had a one-day close over the 200-day. I've been saying, as I said on CNBC and Fox Business, that um, back here in September when everybody was kind of panicking and worried about the market, I was saying, no, this pattern fits with the retracement back to the August or near the August lows. We didn't quite get there on that one, but got close. We got to about 187. You see that we had opened at 187.28 back there on August 24th during that panic when the Dow was down over 1,000 points that morning before snapping back up. So we essentially tested to the opening levels um, around 187.28. Uh, we got to 186.93 right there on September 29th. So that would be your classic kind of double bottom, if you will. Thought there would be a little bit of resistance up around 200. There was this first time. This next time, you can see we moved through it, tested back to 200 support, and then rally. 
Okay, so we're back over the 200-day. What I've been saying is that this this market looks a lot like the um, fall of 2011 market. And here you go when we had the breakdown from the debt downgrade. This is 2011 to compare. Notice we went through some chop, a little bit longer chop basic building phase into early October on that one. But remember, early October, we bought them late September this year. Guess what? Big rally. Look at where that went to. Uh, October 27th. It, what what day is today? The 24th. The Monday will be the 26th. Guess what? We're, we're fitting these time horizons pretty well. A, a close above it there on the 27th on a gap. We we basically tried to rally one more day intraday, but couldn't get through that first day. Remember the high uh, yesterday on the spy was 207.95. So that looks like it should be some resistance on a closing basis. And then we backed off for the next month, all the way into about Thanksgiving of 2011 before we ran back to the 200 days. So my suggestion would be, now that we're above the 200 day, don't say it's all clear. Actually be a little bit cautious right here, looking at the bands and support. And you can see the support of this would actually be closer to about 200 again. Um, so that's where the lower short-term Donchian channel is. KD says, what's the difference between this and a Bollinger Band? Well, of course, a Bollinger Band is more of a standard deviation band. This is really just tracking the highs and lows over a short-term period and then basically comparing it against uh, against uh, what, you know, what the odds are of success. By the way, before I go on, let me show you one other thing, which is that while past performance will never guarantee future results, we base all of our data on testing. Within TradeStation, I can take this strategy performance report data and I can say, okay, if I go in on this system and say, okay, if you went back to the SPY starting point, uh, you can see we started to get data on this around 93 once we add in our long-term trend filter. And you see that, yes, it's made a little more money on the bullish trades and the bearish trades. But what's encouraging to me is, you know, over the last 20 plus years, overall, it's been a pretty bullish time for, for stocks. This system has actually made good money on the short side as well. And while the win percentages on the SPY, uh, you can see, are not super high, the average is 43%, what's impressive to me is that the size of the average win to loss is almost 2 to 1. So that means that you can take your stops quickly. You can also then uh, you know, get a bigger gainer compared to the size of your stop. You can see it's on the market just over a third of the time, 37.7% of the time. So you also are, are picking your spots at which you're doing this. And then the equity curve that we like to see is a very steady equity curve. Yes, there's going to be occasional givebacks, but those green dots mean you're making new equity highs. And if you're looking at it from the start of the last signal, you can see uh, here uh, that ended this year, you can see it's basically been a choppy market for a lot of folks, but it still made some good progress on this system this year as well. So that's a big part of what we do is test that data to say where do we have a positive edge that we can then take advantage of. Now, a big part of what we like to do when we come up with these signals, we're going to get into the scans here in just a second, um, is a big part of what we like to do is we like to get a call and a put on at the same time each, each week. We put these trades out at the end of each week. Um, we used to put them out on Sunday nights only, and then we'd try to get filled on Monday morning. Sometimes we were right too quickly. So ironically, now we put them out usually on Friday about 3 o'clock. We just have a couple of new ones we just put out that are fresh that you can get into uh, for Monday morning. But basically, um, the idea here is that we're trying to make sure we don't miss out on a potential gap situation. So just as an example, and, and I'll show you some other examples uh, looking at uh, the track records of what we've done here in 2015, that basically you can see when we had a buy on Amgen, sometimes, you know, in a, in a buy mode here, like Amgen was giving back in earlier March, uh, you can see that it was just sort of chopping and, st and stabilizing right at that lower um, Donchian channel. And we're above the long-term trend line. These other light blue ones are just kind of an intermediate-term Donchian channel. But we said, look, we think it's going to go back around this upper line, around 160. It gapped up at, right after we got in and shot up uh, past 160. I don't worry, like I said before, about if my resistance target is this upper Donchian channel here and it hits my profit target number, I take that profit and I run. You know, from a buy signal around 155 up to 160, it doesn't seem like a lot, but that five points within options can be very powerful. I'll show you what we did with the option trade here in a second. At the same time that we were getting that bullish signal on Amgen, I found a bearish signal on Pandora, ticker symbol P, and we were saying, okay, Pandora, every stock has, like, people. They have different personalities. Some are, uh, are you know, 
a little bit more slow and steady. Others are more volatile. Um, this is a stock that had these volatile, what I call one-day wonders. We get these really quick one-day snap-ups within the downtrend, like a short covering kind of burst over one, sometimes two days. And you see these short covering bursts running right back into the upper white Donchian channel. Those are giving us sell signals. And you can see a lot of times how quickly they came back down. Pandora, of course, just had a weak earnings report at the end of this past week. Big shot down it had. We didn't have a position on in front of earnings. We tend on this strategy to try to avoid earnings situations and basically, but sometimes you just get these surprises where they just gap down anyway, like it did in February on Pandora. So we did that trade, it gapped down, hit our first target there. Um, shot down the next couple of days and then we trailed the stop and then the second one hit our trailing stop for a smaller gain on that one. So we made money in engine calls, we made money on Pandora puts. This was an example of that what we did back in March and we'll show you some other of the more recent examples. But this is what we call the put call pair. Now a lot of people call pairs trading like trading like two different tech stocks, one long, one short, or two different retail stocks, one long, one short. In my experience, what we're looking for with the Sunday Night Trader system is we're looking for which calls and puts have a positive expectancy, and then I don't care what sector they're in. They don't have to be in the same sector to, to try to hedge that. We're looking at if we've got a positive expectancy on an Amgen call. In this case, we bought a weekly option that had another uh, couple of weeks to go before the expiration, and then a Pandora put that was out to April. Um, that was. And these are in-the-money options usually. So Pandora was trading about 16 and a half. We bought the 18 put. What does that mean? It means that if you buy an 18 put, you've got a, a right to sell the stock at a fixed price of 18. It's already at 16 and a half. That means that that option intrinsically is worth a buck and a half. Why are we paying two for it? The other half dollar of that is time premium. So it's about 75% intrinsic value, about 25% time premium. And that's a good thing. So when you can basically cut your time premium you have to pay down to a third or less, it can really help you to um, stabilize your performance. We still have very clear stops, very clear targets, and we'll even talk about the option chart here in a minute. So going back to the beginning of the year, and I'll bring it up to current, um, you know, obviously, you know, the market has gone through an incredible amount of chop, but you can see that on these type of trades, and sometimes you'll see that there's only one trade in a week. If we don't get filled on one side, then we basically will just, uh, we'll just stay with the one trade we did get filled on if we can't get filled on the other trade. But most of the time, we're getting filled fairly steadily. What's happened, and you'll notice this pattern because of as we keep on refining the system, we were starting with about a 30% stop loss. We've now tightened it up into the 20s and sometimes even tighter than that. So we're actually, um, as the years progress, we've tightened our stop even better. And yet still, you can see we get the occasional Amgen, that one I just showed you, made uh, 69%. The Pandora put made 30% on the first half, 7% on the second. By the way, you see a lot of these half positions. That's another secret of our success is we like to sell a first half usually in that 20, 25, 30% range and then tighten our stop near break even. That's our first kind of progressive trailing stop rule. If you can hit a first profit target, sell half your position, tighten your stop to break even on the rest, the only thing that can mess you up after that is a gap. So, you know, we want to make sure we avoid those kind of gap situations like earnings, but basically saying, look, look at how many ways you can trade this. As you go on in through the spring, you see um, that we we have a number of these where we start, there's where we start to tighten. Look at the stop tightening happening here. You're going to 17%, 20%, 20%, 22, 24, 15. You know what? I'm talking about losers. Why don't I just talk about winners? Because that's not real world trading. Real world trading is knowing how to manage your losers to get rid of your losers quickly and letting your winners or at least part of your winners run. Okay, so sometimes we'll get a win resorts nice uh, gap in our favor where it made 62 and then 84% for us in just a few days on that win put, on the casino stock put. But the, the idea is, you know, you've got to be able to hang around and be able to be in the game through the occasional chop periods, through the occasional little stop outs that you're going to have in any system. I don't care what system it is, it's going to have a, a time where you have to manage the risk. You know, somebody was asking about credit spreads on a prior presentation. You know, credit spreads is a very high probability strategy. The problem that you've got to be careful about with credit spreads is when you're wrong, you can be wrong a lot bigger than your than the size of your average winner. So you've got to, in that strategy, we do credit spreads too as on another system, you've got to manage your risk and cut and run when you're wrong, admit it, and move on. And that's a big part of good trading. So you can see, going into the summer, we were well positioned there. You see, going into June and July here, you can see 
Uh, we we're getting some gains on gold, 30 and 50 percent. Uh, we did get one gap against us. Like this is a here's an example of of why we sell half in case something bad happens. Kihu is a China stock. It's a little more volatile. We took a first part out of the 20 percent gain. Then we walk in one morning, uh, we got a call, and it's gapping way down um, in early uh, July and saying, oh, you know, we're getting whacked on that second piece, we're down 48%. That's not fun when that happens, but here's the thing. If you sold the first half at 20% gain, and then you got bad news, something worked against you, you didn't lose 48% of your whole position here. You actually look at it, you made 20, then you lost 48, so you actually averaged, uh, in this case, more like about a 14 and a half percent loss okay so that's manageable compared to if you were just riding the whole thing and then taking the bigger hit that wouldn't be so much fun right so that's where taking the first profit can really help now sometimes like love puts you see we made 28 percent of the first piece then we're obviously trying to let the second piece run to a bigger profit objective I want to get into scanning here in just a minute but basically I wanted to show you how this has worked and then just looking at uh, since then, okay, let's bring it up to date here, just with pulling up uh, since that late July period here, you go in and look at uh, uh, the trades we've been making since, uh, Michael Kors, Visa, American Express. You see, most of these are pretty, these are fairly big names. We're trading uh, a lot of the bigger names and looking for that kind of, you know, steadier success. Every once in a while, like, we got stung by, you know, the, the August correction, we had an Under Armour call and it gapped down against us. Of course, everything gapped down in that in that period. Uh, but you know, we offset it um, by the gains in uh, in the gold GOLD put position that we had on on Rand Gold Resources. So it's a gold stock at GOLD's symbol. So that's where the put call pair helps to stabilize your performance. And you can see of late, uh, you know, we've we've basically been able to book. Uh, some nice gains in Aetna. We were glad we met you. Um, and then, uh, and we like those kind of weeks where, like on October 9th, we bought the calls on Aetna, 23 and then 50% gains. And then we also bought puts on the Russell, 21 and 24% gains. That's that's kind of nice when you can make money on both sides. The the prior the, the next week we we made some on uh, Accenture. We lost some on XLF puts because everything was going up this past week, right? So so bottom line is that we're going to stay hedged that way. But the point too is that on a ten thousand dollar portfolio, you'd be up to eleven thousand nine twenty four. Again, this is before commissions. So you have to factor your commissions, and you need to make sure your commissions are are small because if they're not, you should check with us and see where you can get your best option commission rates. But uh, your gross profit from 10,000 to 11,924 is about 1,900 bucks this year, or about 19% on that money uh, when the markets are actually, you know, just now getting back to about flat after the recent run-up. Okay, so let's talk scanning. What kind of names are we looking for in Sunday night trader to trade? You'll ironically notice that we try to stay away from the Amazons and the Googles, even though, yes, they had big moves this past week, I know. But you know what? The, the, that More often than not, you know, you can really get burned if you trade them right into earnings. So I'd be cautious on that. But you look at some of the stocks that we like to trade here, and what, what do a lot of these stocks have in common? Disney, Caterpillar, GM, American Express. Anybody tell me, IBM, McDonald's, what those stocks have in common? Home Depot? Walmart, of course, has been getting hammered. There's still opportunities on the bear side when it, when you get a bounce. But these stocks, and I'm underlining here, are actually all Dow stocks. That's right, Peter. Uh, that's not to say that's the only sector that I trade, but the irony is these blue chip names um, test some of the best of anything that I look at. You think American Express, how slow and steady and boring can you get, right? But you look at AXP this year, and interestingly enough, AXP has been lagging all year, you know, even when the market was stronger early in the year, AXP was giving, uh, you know, loads of bear signals, and interestingly enough, like uh, this one that happened in February, stock had a big gap down out of the blue because they lost the exclusive rights on the Costco Wholesale Club uh, credit card deal, uh, and so basically, you know, do we know that's coming? No, but basically you can see that by the time it hits that overbought uh, upper Donchian channel area within the downtrend happening, and you can see what's happened even of late, just even this past week, uh, you know, it was, it was on a sell signal, it was chopping around for a little bit, that's why we like to buy those in the money, safer options, where it doesn't lose so much time while you wait, and then the big gap down happened. Stock was at uh, 76, and then it gapped down to 73. 
You know, so that's the kind of thing where, you know, you look at that and you say, hmm, how's that equity curve look like for AXP? And you say, wow, what a rocket ship of an equity curve. Again, past performance doesn't guarantee future results, but when you look at it across uh, since in the 1970s, it's actually now made more money on shorts than it has on longs, ironically, despite the long-term uptrend in the market. Only in the market about 22% of the time. And you, you say, gee, how is that possible to be so consistent on both sides? And you just say, because look, it's in, and you can see, since the, since the end of the year, our equity was at $7,600 of profit, now it's at $9,600 of profit. You know, so you talk about adding, you know, potentially a 30% to your equity on that particular stock, just trading AXP, of course, all to the downside. Why wouldn't we trade the bull side and catch some of these bounces off the lower channel? Because it's too risky when you're in a longer term downtrend. Okay, so that's a big part of it too. So let's just talk scanning here for a few uh, and basically say a big part of what I do is I'll just literally go through I look at stock charts and I look at option charts, but I've got just a list, of, and let's just actually focus on some of the more active ones for starters, okay? So if we're just saying, if you're looking at your hyperactive, most active stuff, obviously Microsoft had the big earnings there on uh, Friday, and you can see, we didn't have a position on Microsoft because um, it uh, wasn't it was above the, the longer term moving average, so we would never fade into that resistance for just that reason. Ironically, with Microsoft, and, and this is what I, part of what I do too, is I've got these equity curves up on another of my four monitors, and basically I'm running through and you go, would you really want to even trade Microsoft through that? Um, you see it's really not done that well over the last 15 years. That, that rally was actually a new 15-year high, but it's been a long time coming for Microsoft. Uh, so the, the, the performance graph actually looks very unstable. We wouldn't want to trade that as much. You know, you look at some of these other really active names, Bank America, giving a short, and that's why I said we got into XLF. So here's an example. We were getting a short signal about a week and a half ago on Bank America. And you see Bank America has been pretty good on its equity curve, um, and it's, but its shorts haven't been as good. And I actually said, well, XLF is also giving us a sell signal in that same window, and look, it was profitable in shorts as well as longs. It was making money, and its equity curve was even more steady. Now, guess what? I missed on that one. You know, you can't be right on all of them, but the idea is you're trying to put the odds in your favor. That's a very steady equity curve. We just happened to catch one of those little dips, um, but when we go and look, the shorts are more profitable than the longs. You know, running back into all this overhead resistance, thought it would hold, Guess what? Market goes straight up for a week. Going to have a hard time uh, in in the whole financial sector betting that it's going to buck that trend and not get pulled up by the overall rally in the Dow, which you see was straight up this week, right? But you know, like I said, we made up for it with the Accenture um, example where we were picking up that Accenture was coming down near some support from the prior week and then starting to bounce up into there. Took a first. Uh, First target actually whipped us out on that second piece right before it then took off to new highs the last two sessions, okay? But that's okay. That happens. What about, like, the gold miners, GDX? You know, you look at that and you say, okay, GDX compared to gold, GDX looks like it's strengthening a little bit on some of the other indicators we look at, like percent R, CCI. We teach you about all these. But, you know, when I look at that, that's the gold miners. It's mildly positive. You know, but you see the overall equity curve is not really that straight up line that we would like to see. So that's not going to really interest me right now. What about Apple? There's Apple. Let's go take a peek at that real quick. So you see Apple giving a fresh new sell um, at Friday's close. Guess what? I'm not interested in that right now. Why? Well, it's not been as good on shorts as it has been on longs. But the other thing is that um, you see this, this directional movement line should have showed some resistance there earlier in the week, and the stock just moved right on through it. Around 115, 115 and a half, moved right on through it and gapped up there Friday morning, kept surging. Yes, it's still below its long-term trend line, about 121 and a half. I've certainly said to people that, look, Apple now is the market. I mean, Apple is in the Dow. By the time stocks get added to the Dow, historically, that's not the best time to own those stocks. Usually they start to lag a little bit compared to their past patterns. Obviously, Apple is a huge company, um, and it's a very successful one. But the point is, is that okay? We would probably look more for the long side trades because the equity curve shows a lot better there. So I go through these scans and I just keep looking at patterns. I just a big rally. You know, Facebook gave a nice little buy, and this this is one of one of the points I wanted to make. 
is, you know, everybody was panicking a month ago, you know, but, you know, when I look at Facebook and it's giving me a buy there in 928 and everybody's hating the market and you go in and you look at it and you say, well, you know what, the long trades are actually pretty successful. Short trades, not so much, but the long trades have been in a nice little pattern here. That, that give back was a recent uh, bear trade before that, you know, um, but and and it did get faked out by that August pullback there too, but you know basically you say look when it rallies back up into your short term donchi and you sell it into that that's that's just good trading buy the buy the lows uh, the the support you know buy the fear and then sell the hope sell into the rally sell into the resistance okay so the idea is that as we go through these examples so like one that I mentioned that we traded a, a little bit ago was the Russell 2000. If I was looking for an index to, to be bearish on here, I mentioned that I'm concerned that the market after maybe Monday may run out of some gas. If I'm looking for an index to be bearish on after Monday, it'll probably be the Russell. Why? Because it's still on an active short signal. When we go and we look at the strategy performance for the Russell, it's been pretty steady up. We just recently had a new equity high. It's not straight up, but it's you can actually see that the shorts are still profitable as well as the longs. You know, yeah, it's been an overall bull market, so it's harder to make money on a short in an index. However, that last one was quite effective. So, you know, we're kind of bumping around back and forth between these directional movements, supports, and resistances. And so this one's in a pretty tight range between about 112.66 uh, as the recent low and then resistance up here around 116.30. Now, not, not too long from now, we're going to lose that other low, and then it'll turn into a support closer to about 113.65. Uh, so it's something else we'll be paying attention to. But I still think we might be able to squeeze after a little more of a rally Monday, maybe a bear signal out of that. I'm not making a recommendation here, but I do want to also point out, if I was, if I was going to uh, be looking at a potential put on IWM, when you convert these stocks into options, you don't go and buy the at-the-money 116 put. That's high risk. For example, you know the the high the wrong trade here would be if you're buying the November. We usually buy about a month out. If you're buying the November 116 put, let me just show you that option for a second. Remember, we're we're 15 cents below that. We're 15 cents in the money. You would be paying uh, 230 or so. Okay, only 15 cents of that 230 is intrinsic value. That means that 95% of your option is at time risk. Time option you know that a lot of aggressive traders like to trade that to me that's the wrong choice if I was and again it's not a recommendation but I would say you know what you know what if we went just uh, even just a, a couple more points in the money for starters I might even go further in the money here but if you went to the 118 put now look at how it starts to change the configuration a little bit we're trading at about uh, 15 cents under 116 so the 118 put has about two dollars and 15 cents of intrinsic value and you're paying about 3.30 or so. So you're paying about a buck uh, 15 out of that 3.30 in time. That's starting to get closer to the right ratio that I look for. I might even go up one more level until like the 119 puts a little more in the money. This one's like $3.15 of intrinsic value and you're paying about four bucks. You're paying about 85 cents. Now you're only paying just over 20% of the options premium as time rather than paying 95% time if you bought the wrong 116 uh, more aggressive choice. So you can see the Donchian channels work on the option chart too. For, for an, it needs to be active to account, but a lot of these big indexes are plenty active. So you can see if I'm trading this option chart, I've got some pretty clear lines in the sand where I can see the past resistance around this short term one was about 565 it traded to back on the 21st and then the other uh, Donchian resistance I'm picking up is closer to about six and three quarters. Okay, we're going to eventually lose that so you've got to pay attention to maybe taking a first profit back near the, the recent uh, resistance and then keeping your second target up towards the bigger picture resistance. But you see there's also a lot of support down into the recent lows in this option down around 380. Um, we traded to 393 on Friday. Again, that doesn't guarantee that I should buy it. I'm going to wait a little bit watching it, but I'm stalking that trade now. So literally, I've been just kind of going through my list. You look at FXI, you know, the China stocks have been rallying, and that's a little too strong when we look at the directional movement line, so we stay away. Now, you look at oil. Oil's actually, you know, after everybody's getting hyped on it a, f a few weeks ago on this little rally, we're below the long-term trend line. No way I'm going to buy oil when we're below that long-term trend line. I'm going to actually be looking for selling opportunities if they present themselves properly. So we go through that whole process 
you know, Yahoo had bad earnings and then it rallied back on Alibaba um, here later in the week. So Yahoo has been one that's been kind of a laggard. You know, we might kind of watch that one. But, you know, because we're, we're, there's the Alibaba one in comparison, and you see Baba's just a little too strong. Yahoo is relatively weaker. So if I'm going to short something, I'm going to short the relatively weaker choice. Now, I'm, I'm basically uh, kind of just kind of re let me recap so quickly for you how we do this. We use um, TradeStation and then we send out these signals and I pick out them all, all that scanning process I'm showing you where I'm just walking you through trade by trade and comparing and contrasting one against another. It's coming up with these then entry and exit alerts that we send out in real time. And basically, let me just show you how you can take advantage of it here. Uh, I'm going to pull up a, a, a page here, and then I'll post a link there in a second. So now we're a little time crunch. So if you go in here to this, uh, we call it the system Sunday Night Trader. Okay, so if you go into this page, uh, and I'm going to post it here for you. It's bigtrends.com uh, forward slash Sunday Night Trader. Okay, so when you go to bigtrends.com forward slash Sunday Night Trader, Trader, make sure it's going out to the entire audience here. Okay, Sunday Night Trader. That's what we call this service. Um, that's why we did the crossword puzzle because it's like you get a little more time on Sundays to do your crossword. You get a little more time to study these. Uh, and usually we'd we'd uh, go in there and, and sell it a month at a time at ninety nine dollars. So I'm actually allowing you the ability to lock in uh, a thirty percent savings on that and just book it a, a month at a time for just sixty nine bucks every thirty days. Now what this entails is that we send you these real time email alerts uh, on Friday afternoon and then also reinforcing the training on on the Sunday video and the Sunday recap and then tell you again on Monday morning, hey, you can still get into this one. So bottom line is that with this, you're getting a lot of different things here. So you're getting um, these real-time trade alerts. That's two opportunities every single Friday at 3 p.m. and then recapped again on Sunday through a video analysis that I do. We post it on Sunday evenings uh, by 6 p.m. with that video analysis of why I think that these are well-positioned trades. Um, and so you're constantly getting this training from me through the video analysis, recapping what we traded, what worked, what didn't, as well as what we've got out there now. Okay, so let me actually share that screen again, make sure you can see that. Um, so basically when you go to that page at bigtrends.com slash Sunday Night Trader, you can hit that add to cart button, you can lock in a month at a time at 69 bucks. It's set up for your convenience uh, as an auto renew, basically every 30 days. If you like it, you don't have to do anything, I'll just keep rebuilding at the same rate. We don't change the price on you, we just keep it 69 bucks a month consistently um, on this special so that you can go ahead and know that if you like it, you can look at it and say, hey, 69 bucks for the month, look at the potential over, over the course of uh, this year so far. Like I said, we've taken a $10,000 portfolio up to 11,924 um, gross profit, so about $1,900 gross profit on a 10K account. We tend to recommend that type of an account size because we don't want to commit. That's based on not committing more than $1,000 a trade. So it's saying we're not assuming any kind of compounding or any kind of excessive thing. We're just saying if you're spending about a thousand bucks a trade in. Um, so far, that's about 19% gross for the year when the market's basically about flat. Uh, do you have to have the, uh, the trade station software, Thomas? No, you do not. We send you the real-time alerts, and then you can take advantage of it. And so, again, I'm out of time, but go to that page. When you hit the Add to Cart button, I just quickly walk you through that. You could also get my boot camp training session, which is a few hundred dollar value for just a hundred dollar one-time add-on. If you want to add that on, you can add that on for the one-time hundred bucks, and it's just one sixty-nine your first uh, investment. And then going forward, it would just rebuild at the sixty-nine dollars every thirty days. Uh, you just hit the green checkout button, and then you're good to go. And just fill out your key information there. Of course, take all your major credit cards. It's on the secure page, HTTPS. You can just say, uh, I helped you, or you saw it uh, through the webinar here today, whichever. Um, and if you want to get um, text alerts on this, too, in the customer note field, you can say, yeah, send me text alerts in the customer note to this uh, smartphone number that you have, and we'll send you through text as well as email. Just review the terms and conditions below. Just spelled out in full right here. And then it's real clear how that works. And then if you ever need to cancel, if you don't want it to auto renew, or you just you, you just want to try it for the month and be done, you can just uh, we've got all the directions down here about how you can um, go ahead and send us a note to not auto renew if that's not of interest to you. But we've got people that stayed on it for literally uh, years at this point that see great value in that. You just hit the submit order button, you're good to go. So basically, go to that page, check it out. And if you have any questions too on the on that, uh, let's see, one second on this page here. 
Uh, you can also see you can email us or call us toll free. If you can't remember that 800 number, just remember it's 1-800-BIG-TRENDS. I'm out of time. I need to hand it back over to Reed. Say thank you, Reed, for the great job you do hosting these and allowing everybody to get so much great information on this Saturday. Hope you enjoyed it, everybody, and feel free to call us anytime you have questions. Take care, trade them well, and enjoy the rest of the educational sessions today.